All right. All right. Well, before Bob gets us further down the rabbit hole of indecency, um, we're in Second Kings six twenty four. Um, we have the lighted section and the lighted section. Trying to keep the heat out, because you know, for us, it lights put off a whole lot of heat. But uh, you remember when we were last together, which was about three weeks ago, uh, uh, the um, there was the well. I'll just I'll just read it, verse uh, twenty-three. So he prepared for them a great feast, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. They did not. And they went to their master, and the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. So uh, the, the Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, or Aram, as it's uh, sometimes called, or Aram Damascus, as this man has it, uh, had been raiding in Israel and, and, and um, engaging in what we would today call human trafficking, of course, enslaving uh, the people of God and, and, and carrying them off and uh, plundering and so forth. Uh, but the, the uh, king of Aram Damascus had a little problem. He was trying to... Uh, capture the king of Israel to ransom him or to depose him. Uh, but Elisha would regularly tell uh, the king of Israel, don't go there because the Syrians are going to be there, go somewhere else. And so the king of Syria uh, decided to um, cut off the uh, source, uh, and he sends a, a large task force to where uh, Elisha is. And of course, as it turns out, uh, the task force gets captured, but they're shown mercy. And so um, the last thing uh, Jeremiah tells us is that they respond in kind. They respond mercifully with no more rage. We pick up um, at verse uh, 24 with the announcement of the resumption of hostilities. This isn't a contradiction. They're not on a raid. They're in all-out war. And uh, as it says, you see, um, um, afterwards, so sometimes it's past. Uh, but the, the purpose of the, uh, or the, the main thrust of Jeremiah's uh, narrative here is to highlight the unbelief in Israel, in uh, Samaria. Well, before we read uh, God's word, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy to us in the gospel. We pray you would speak to us as we come to your word. We ask that uh, we would not be like the The people of Samaria, the people of Israel, your covenant people of old who saw uh, your mercy uh, but despised you. Enable us to enter into your rest. We pray in, in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Kings 6, 24. Afterward, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mustered his entire army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria as they besieged it until the donkeys had been sold were 80 shekels of silver and a fourth part of a cob of dove's dung uh, for five shekels of silver. Now as the king of Israel went uh, passing by on the wall, the woman cried out to him saying, Help, my lord the king. And he said, If the lord will not help you, how shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? And the king asked her, What is your trouble? She answered, This woman said to me, Give me your son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So he boiled my son and ate him. And the next day I said to her, Give your son, that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Uh, when the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. And I was passing by on the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had Sekal underneath on his body. And he said, May God do, do so to me and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. Now the king had dispatched a man from his presence, but before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, Do you see how this murderer has sent to take off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold fast the door against him. He is not the sound of his master's feet behind him. And while he was still speaking with them, the messenger came down to him and said, The trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? But Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow, about this time, a seah of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel. 
and two sayas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Then the captain on whom hand the king leaned said to the man of God if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven could this thing be but he said you shall see it with your own eyes but you shall not eat of it now there were four men who were lepers at the entrance to the gate and they said to one another why are we sitting there until we die if we say let us enter the city the famine is in the city and we shall die there and if we uh, sit here we shall die also so now come, let us go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. So they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had made the army of the Syrians to the sound of chariots and horses and the sound of a great army. So they said to one another, Behold, the king has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to come against us. So they fled away in the twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was, and fled for their lives. And when the, these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into the tent and ate and drank, and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried off things from it and went and hid them. Then they said to one another, We are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they came and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them we came to the camp of the Syrians and behold, there was no one to be seen or heard. Nothing but horses tied and donkeys tied and the tents as they were. And the gatekeepers called out and it was told within the king's household and the king rose in the night and told and his servants, I will tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know we are hungry, therefore let us. they have gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the open country, thinking when they come out of the city, we shall take them alive and shall get into the city. And one of his servants said, Let some men take five of the remaining horses, seeing that those who are left here, uh, how they will fare, like the whole multitude of Israel who have already perished. Let us send and see. So they took two horsemen. And the king sent them after the army of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. So they went after them as far as the Jordan. And behold, all the way was littered with garments and equipment. And the Syrians had thrown down their equipment in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Syrians. So a saya of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two sayas of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Now the king had appointed the captain on whose hand he leaned to, to have charge of the gate. And the people trampled him in the gate so that he died. As the man of God had said, when the king came down to him. For when the man of God had said to the king, to say as a barley shall be sold for a shekel and a sale of fine flour for a shekel about this time tomorrow in the gate of Samaria, the captain had answered the man of God, if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he said... You shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so it happened to him. For the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. Amen. The spark of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. We've got the hardship of war, uh, don't we? Um, 24 to 29. Famine in Samaria. Famine and, I suppose we should say, inflation as well. Um, this famine, though, is not caused by weather, not caused by climate, as uh, has uh, happened um, uh, before, right? There was a drought, and that caused a famine. But now they have an army encamped around Samaria. Samaria, though, remember, was founded by Omri, the father of Ahab. It was an excellent choice for a capital city. It was surrounded by hills, uh, buttressed by cliffs, making uh, the walls almost impregnable. Uh, remember, they didn't have uh, cannons, and, and uh, siege equipment was only mediocre, bringing down walls. And so the only way to take uh, the city of Samaria was uh, to starve it, at least uh, for most powers. Um, and war has resumed between Syria and Israel. Uh, no longer is Syria simply sending raiding parties, but they have mustered their entire force. And we learn uh, the severity of the siege. Obviously, the siege has been going on for some months or more likely uh, a year or more because of the prices of food. 
Uh, a shekel, remember, was a, a, a day's wage for a laborer, similar to in the New Testament era. A denarius being a, a day's wage for a laborer. Uh, so you have a donkey's head. Uh, what is that? 80 shekels? Now, a donkey's head, um, does anybody, you know, you drive, you're driving down to the fate and you see a, a, a field of cows and you, oh, look, they got some donkeys in there. Don't those donkeys look uh, delicious? Anybody? No? Nobody? Nobody likes donkeys? Donkey's head? Uh, not really nutritious, certainly not kosher. Uh, and uh, not really very filling because, I mean, I guess the only thing to eat in a donkey's head is its tongue and <laughs> brains. Went there in World War II. Eyeballs. They were Eyeballs, racing. that's right. There was a lot of horse meat eaten during World War II. And, and, and I guess if you shop in Aldi in Europe and get their lasagna, you could eat horse meat as well. Remember that scandal? Uh, but people enjoyed it, right? Nobody, nobody seemed to complain. They just... Did an audit of the meatpacking facility, but this isn't horse meat, though, is it? This and this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't donkey loin. Um, this isn't. I guess you know all mammals have a tender loin, and a, uh, this isn't that though. This is this is this is the brains and the tongue and the eyeballs. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, I don't know how much a donkey eyeball, uh, but it's not filling, not nutritious, and not kosher. And then pigeon manure. Um, question as to whether um, this is used as fuel or for eating. Um, others have, have suspected that this is a metaphor for carob pods, which are the pods the pigs ate in uh, Luke 15, the uh, prodigal son. So the famine is a result of the siege, which has gone on for some many months, perhaps even a year or more, um, because obviously they're, they're out of, of uh, you know, normal things to eat, like Pop-Tarts. Uh, but also the famine is a consequence of unbelief, as we'll see, in the high places of Israel. And, and, and it will become especially pronounced uh, when we get to that ending section where things are repeated verbatim. Right? Whenever the scripture repeats something, right, they didn't have copy and paste then. Right? Some, now today, if you're reading something and, and uh, it's on the interweb, sometimes uh, the author will rather pretentiously uh, put some of his own words in, in sort of a different font and make it bigger. And sometimes there'll be a little bird next to it because you're supposed to tweet that out. He thinks, oh, that's important, so he puts it in there twice. Well, they, they didn't have uh, Twitter uh, back in, in, in the Bible days. People, you know, they were smarter then, so they didn't need Twitter. Um, but the, the authors would still repeat things that are important. And so that's, that's the theme of this whole section, unbelief. Well, we get now uh, to verses 26 to 29, maternal cannibalism. The king is apparently out on the wall as he's surveying the defenses, uh, as he's trying to get his Strava numbers up, maybe inspecting the troops. Some woman uh, calls out to him. She hails him, and, and uh, you know, she wants help. And, and the king replies uh, with sarcasm, right? Uh, if God's not going to help you, if Yahweh won't help you, <laughs> what, what, what can I do to you? Uh, revealing his uh, despair at this situation, right? Either from the threshing field, uh, th threshing floor, or the wine press, right? There's no wine. There's no bread. What, what, what can I do? Um, but notice this unbeliever. He references. He even blames God for this situation in tough times. But then she, she relays her complaint. The siege is so severe that mothers uh, covenanted, compacted. Uh, to boil their own sons and eat them. And I think this is a clear allusion uh, to Solomon, right? Uh, remember the, 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 the prostitutes had that agreement. Or they didn't have an agreement. They, the one mother stole the other uh, child. I think there's, there's just an allusion here to, to contrast the days of Solomon with this. Right now it's not just prostitutes who are, who are switching up the the, the carcass for the live one. Now it's just it's the mothers of Israel who are eating their own uh, children. Now this is even more disgusting uh, than it would be uh, today because not only, of course, the, the, the maternal cannibalism, but to eat, a, eat your son was to eat your retirement, was to eat your security. She's in very dire straits. Uh, well, the second mother hides her son and refuses to follow through on the, the harvest, the, the butchering of, of her son. You know, what kind of a heartless parent does this? Certainly indicates 
the sort of society, uh, the degeneration of society in Samaria. But the king is, is shocked by it. He's not prepared for such barbarism. He tears his clothes in grief, in grief and uh, sackcloth is exposed, the garments of repentance. But the sackcloth was hidden. He didn't want his grief exposed. Uh, was it under his royal robes? Was he clinging to the dignity of a prince? Well, he was trying to exercise some private piety. The king has been trying out repentance, but there's been no improvement. Well, let's look at relief and unbelief, verse 30 down to verse 2 of the next chapter. Um, the king has tried repentance, right? He's wearing sackcloth. He's, he's, he's repented. He's, he's checked that off. I, I have worn sackcloth. Things should get better. I've repented. And so what does he do? He blames Elisha. Why? Because Elisha's God hasn't fixed this. I've done what I am supposed to do. Right? The king has a has a utilitarian, not unitarian, utilitarian religion. Right? A faith that is useful insofar as it is useful. Right? Religion is useful insofar as it as is useful and practical and advantageous. He's willing to wait for God's deliverance or submit to his providence. So long as it comes in the way I think it should come. Now the king uh, acknowledges his his powerlessness to help the situation. Uh, He acknowledges there are problems that his government cannot solve. It's it's idolatrous to presume the government is omnipotent. Apparently, it's not included here, but I think we're intended to infer that Elisha had instructed the king to repent. Now the king sees that a solution has been offered, repent, but that solution, that, that resolution is not coming on the king's timeline. And so Elisha needs to die because Elisha hasn't. Hasn't come through. Well, he sends his henchmen, and the henchman is hindered. Uh, Elisha has gathered the city fathers or the elders uh, to his home. They're presumably praying for deliverance. And he becomes aware of the king's plots against him. After all, Elisha knew the king of Syria's plots. Certainly, he knows the king of Israel's plots. God reveals them to him. Uh, God has consistently protected his prophet from harm. And so he orders the elders, just bar the door. Don't let the assassin in the house. After all, the king's going to be here anyway. And so the henchman, exasperated, he he decries, well, this disaster is from God. He, too, uh, learns religion. The king is tired of repenting. The king has rejected Elisha's counsel. The king expected that deliverance, but instead disaster, starvation, and cannibalism are the only effects. And so Elisha, whose counsel the king heeded in an outward way, Elisha's counsel seems to have failed, right? The king had this, this transactional relationship with God. I will do X and God will give me Y. I repent God delivers. God is obligated to do what I want because I have done what God wants. And that's a common line of thinking. The king's power, the king's repentance cannot save the people. And so the king lashes out at God and his prophet because of the king's still fundamental unbelief. Well, belief is promised in the first two verses of chapter 7. Elisha says, the next day, Abundant food will come. It seems too good to be true. Now, it's not to be confused with cheap food, right? Normally, a shekel would buy 100 quarts of barley. A seya is only 15 quarts. Um, So this is the beginning of the return to normalcy. It's like if gas prices were 359 instead of 439. Oh, hey, that, that's an improvement, right? It's, you know, they're coming down, but uh, so uh, this is not normalcy. This is not cheap food. This is food is available food. A shekel would normally buy you know, five times this amount. Um, and they're no longer eating donkey brains and bird poo. They'll be eating real food. And the king's adjutant, the captain on whose arm he leans, responds in sarcastic unbelief. If even the heavens were open, could God do this? 
words that sign his own death warrant, don't they? Elisha required the hearers to believe in God's word. You see, it teaches us something about Christian faith, that God requires faith in his word. God does not require merely faith generally. Right? You just have to believe. God requires faith in his word, that God will do what he promises. All right, John 14, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you, but a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Believe in his word, right? Uh, Galatians 1, grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. And freedom uh, from sin, safe uh, for holiness. Christ gave himself for our sin. That's what we are required uh, to believe. It's not uh, that there is... Um, Simply a belief that things will get better or a belief generally that God will show mercy. But because this adjutant does not believe God's word, he will lose the benefit of God's word. He will see the fulfillment of it, but he won't taste the feast. And this is, of course, how all unbelievers are. They will see. And every eye will see him. Every knee will bow, but they will not taste of his salvation. God will vindicate himself. God will reveal his salvation, but only those who have believed his word will receive that salvation. Right, well, there's an abrupt transition here where we're left wondering, well, how is this going to come about? Well, we have deliverance by lepers. Um, salvation is announced, and, and, and you see in verses 3 and 4 this uh, kind of uh, gallows humor of these, of these lepers. They realize... Death is certain, right? If I, if I stay where I am, I'm going to starve to death. If I go into the city, we're probably going to starve to death. If we go over to the camp of the Syrians, they'll probably kill us, but maybe they won't. Let's go to the camp of the Syrians. And so at twilight, they determine to see if the Syrians will welcome them, and they find the camp deserted. The prophet tells us it has been a miraculous deliverance. Uh, that God caused the Syrian army to flee, believing Israel hired the Hittites and the Egyptians to come and to attack them from north and from the south. And so the lepers begin to plunder the camp. They go from one tent to the next tent, gorging themselves, feasting, and stashing treasures. One wonders how, after doing this for so long, how they were able to walk to stash their treasures, and yet uh, they are. Well, their hunger pangs have been replaced by pangs of conscience in verses 9 to 11. They realize we are not doing what is right. We're guilty, they say. We, we need to determine the gatekeepers. We need to inform uh, the gatekeepers and the king of this deliverance. You know, it's interesting that, that uh, Jeremiah, as he records this, doesn't, uh, kind of leaves their motivation a little bit ambiguous, doesn't he? Uh, we're not doing right. And if we don't do right, we're going to be punished in the morning. Come sun up, we're going to have a problem, so we might as well do what we're supposed to do anyway. Uh, they do right, at least in part, for fear of punishment, and that's fine. Um, not ideal, but, you know, it's fine. Uh, well, let's look at unbelief and fulfillment, verses 12 to 20. You have a skeptical king and a wise servant, verses 12 to 15. The king believes it's a trick, right? He's seen Helen of Troy, the movie probably not seen her, but probably saw the movie, you know, when it was, it was on Netflix or whatever. Um, he says, you know what, there's no horse here, because we're eating donkey brains. Uh, didn't want to rub it in too much. Um, but it's a trick. They're, they're, these, are, these are tricksy little Arameans. Uh, they, they deserted their camp because they know we're hungry. They know they can't breach our walls, right? Remember, the walls of Samaria uh, were, were powerful. Now, the Assyrians uh, would take the city up, the city in... Um, generation's time, but uh, the walls are firm, and the Assyrians were much more powerful than the Arameans or the Syrians ever were. 
so the, the, the Syrians, the Arameans, realize we're not going to breach those walls. Sieges are expensive. Why are sieges expensive? Because you've got to pay an army, you've got to feed an army, and you've got to pay an army and feed an army for a long time. Because what happens when soldiers don't get paid? They usually come after the general, whose tent is a lot nicer, and after they've gotten the general's tent, they usually head home. Right? So you've got, you've got to keep the, the payroll coming. You know, this is remarkable unbelief. Because what had Elisha said would happen? Now, he didn't say it expressly, right? He didn't say it explicitly that the army of the Syrians would disperse. But he did say flour, barley, and, and wheat are going to be sold for relatively cheaply and available. But the king doesn't believe it. He doesn't believe deliverance is at hand. He refuses to believe in God's power. And so we need to see by way of application that miracles don't bring faith. Or you have a report of good news and still no faith. This is, of course, the, the stupidest kind of unbelief. And it, even in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, right, as we're, we're seeing in, in John 6 with, the, with, the, with the, the loaves and the fishes, people don't believe him, even as they taste, even as they eat. Miracles don't believe faith, don't create faith. Well, a servant suggests, you know, why don't we send out a few riders on some of the remaining horses to, to scout out and see, is this a trick? And now he says, let's send out five horses, and they only send out two horsemen. So I'm not sure how the math works out. Maybe they intended to send five horsemen, but found it only, uh, only two horses with their brains intact. I don't know. Um, what? Yeah. Yeah, 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 I, I, yeah, you think, but... Um, uh, so they send out, maybe, maybe they're on chariots, but then somebody, who, who gets the, the three horsepower chariot and who gets the two horsepower chariot? Um, I don't know. Uh, but the scouts return with glad tidings. The Syrian army has abandoned its camp. Uh, they, they've abandoned their equipment. They got the horses tied, and, and uh, I don't know if anybody's salivating over the horses. Maybe the, uh, the Aldi brothers are, but um, nobody else seems to be uh, salivating over the horses. Deliverance has come. The word of deliverance was prophesied by Elisha. But news of the deliverance comes from unclean lepers and some unnamed servants. Lowliness and obscurity seem to be some of God's favorite means of revealing his salvation. Now, so you have the skeptical king, the wise servant, and then the dead servant, or the servant who perishes in unbelief. We come back to um, where we left off at the end of chapter uh, uh, 6. Remember the king's adjutant, his, his captain, who, full of arrogance, full of sarcasm, decried God's word of deliverance, God's promise of salvation. You would think he would be the first to repent. You would think he would be quick to apologize. But he's not. He gets a new job. He's uh, placed in command at one of the gates to keep the people in line because somebody's going to make a profit off of this. It's not just going to go for free. And so obviously somebody's going to be collecting those 15 um, shekels and so forth. Um, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like Black Friday, right? <laughs> and, and, and he's the security guard trying to keep people out of, uh, away from the, the, the 42-inch televisions that are going for $99. And the crowd tramples them, don't they? They're famished. They're starving. They're unwilling to be just restrained from the, the booty just beyond the gate. And so God's word comes to pass. It's, it's repeated for us here. He heard God's promise of, promise of deliverance. He saw God's deliverance. But he wouldn't taste it. Because it was too fanciful to be believed. It was too... Incredible. So he doesn't believe it. Maybe, maybe we're even to, meant to read into it that he's, he's actually keeping the people, right? slowing them down from, from receiving God's deliverance. I, I, I don't know. It's certainly uh, worthy of consideration. Is, is that uh, there by way of implication? That he's actually trying to keep the people from going and getting their fill. Remember what the 
apostle to the Hebrews warned, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when he refused when he refused uh, when they refused him who warned from heaven, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. It's just a little unbelief. You know, I wonder if, if this adjutant didn't even remember making that comment. It's sort of a it's sort of a throwaway comment. Well, you know, even 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 if uh, even if the heavens are open about this. Okay. You know, he probably forgot he even said it. A little unbelief. It was just maybe it was even just a, a comment made as a reflex. You know, sometimes we do that. Somebody says one thing, you say another thing. Hi, how are you? Fine. Or we just do that. Hi, how are you? Fine. Even if you're not. It's just what we do. A little unbelief is dangerous. From the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If we do not believe God's word of promise, we will forfeit the blessings from God's word. God's word of judgment. God's word of grace. God's call to holiness. Do we believe his words? God offers salvation from our sin. God promises it in his word. Salvation from sin for all who believe the words of Christ and respond in repentance and faith. And here we have illustrated in miniature what happens to those who neglect such a great salvation. Who disbelieve. Who reject a testimony to the truthfulness of the author. Here's God's power to save. He saved a city from starvation overnight because it was a city of his people. This is how God cares for his people. He saves his people. Do we believe that he is the one who saves? He saves his people from death, death for our sins, death because of our unbelief. Will we turn away from unbelief and trust his word? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the mercy that you have shed abroad in the Lord Jesus Christ. Enable us to rest in him, to love him, to trust him, to believe him, to adore him, to obey him. Forgive us of our many sins, we ask in his name. Amen. All right, I've got to turn off the broadcast before anybody gives out your social security numbers. Because there is actually one person watching this week. Good night. Uh...